say welcome and praise the Lord to everyone uh, on the internet uh, that is watching right now or will be watching later. On behalf of our pastor, Bishop C. Sean Tyson, thank you for joining us here at Calvary Ministries International for Midweek Manna. I'm Minister Katrina Jones, and we would like for you to invite someone to join you by hitting that share button and invite someone to come in and to sit at, uh, to sit and to hear the word of the Lord. I'm going to read uh, the announcements for this ensuing week. Today, the afternoon Bible class, uh, I'm sorry, today, after afternoon Bible class, the Mount Calvary Executive Office will be closed. And that's immediately following Bible class, the Executive Office will be closed. We are continuing to pray for the family of Minister Barry Jenkins in the loss of his sister, whose memorial service is this Saturday. And we are praying for Sister Tina Glenn in the passing of her cousin, Darnell Mullins. Funeral information is in the foyer. Next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. As we're in prayer and consecration, entitled The Fast of Promise Fulfilled, information is available through Friday with fasting directives and prayer targets. Also, information is on the church website. Today's lesson will be replayed at 7 p.m. on the YouTube and Facebook channels. At 6 p.m., Teen Challenge will have their service at the Florence Dale Chapel. All are welcome. Thursday, on May 16th, Sanctuary Prayer and Exhortation will convene here from 6 to 7 p.m., followed by small groups. The Women's Ecclesia will have a guest speaker named Kathy Grzynski. She will discuss mental health awareness. And the A1 brothers will have Brother Morris Kennedy discussing self-defense techniques at 7 p.m. Friday, celebrate recovery from 6 to 7.30 p.m. And this is a reminder to sign up for the MTC Business Resource Directory. Details are on the website. That's www.calvaryforyou.org. The deadline is tomorrow, May 15th. If you have any questions, please contact Dr. Constance Longmire. Now, this coming Sunday, which is Pentecost Sunday, May the 19th, there will be a 6 a.m. prayer here at the church. 6 a.m. this Sunday here at the church. Sunday Academy will convene at 9 a.m. 10 a.m. will be our morning worship as we're, and we're all wearing white on this Sunday morning. At 4 o'clock p.m., we uh, will be our Sound of Pentecost special, uh, special service. The guests will be Pastor Todd Johnson and the Second Baptist Church of Warren. They will be our guests on this uh, coming Sunday at 4 p.m. Please govern yourselves according to these announcements. Uh, our pastor has uh, entered into the room, so we would like to introduce to some, present to others, our pastor, Bishop C. Sean Tyson. I was praying that we would not have that kind of honor, attention, and celebration. I was praying that it would be a whole other meeting. I was praying that you would. 
to experience more things like Sunday. Mother's Day to be celebrated all year long. They do so much for all of us, and we're just grateful for you, and I pray that you will certainly enjoy your day and prove to your fullness. Well, I pray today that those of you that are joining us online are experiencing the blessings and the favor of God, and as your week is off to a, a blessed beginning, I'm praying that God is preparing our hearts through fasting and prayer for what I'm believing is going to be a tremendous Pentecost Sunday. I really am looking for God to do something supernatural in that service. We're not celebrating it just as a, um, a tradition. I really believe that God wants to do something special for us, and not just for us, but for our community, for the religious community in the Youngstown area. It is significant that we are coming together to worship with Second Baptist Church, and of course, those of you that are from the area know that Second Baptist is one of, his, one of the historical churches in Warren, Ohio. Over 100 years old, it has a very uh, storied history in our community. So for them, and I believe this is the first time that we have had a fellowship service with Second Baptist, God is in that. And he's doing something uh, spiritual that I believe is going to set a precedent and create new momentum for a spiritual reformation. I had the word revival in my mind, and the Lord said that is not the correct word. The correct word is spiritual reformation. We're not thinking in terms of a one-day exchange. I'm looking for something to happen that's going to continue beyond Pentecost Sunday. I shared with you that the Lord indicated that this is the year of the young people. When we were at Second Baptist Church ministering uh, there uh, a couple of months ago, I was saying with Pastor Todd Johnson, he was saying to me, Pastor Tyson, we're having, now here he is, a youthful, dynamic young man indicating the, the, the challenge he was having in getting young people to connect with the church. He has all of this innovative, all of these innovative ideas, creativity, and yet struggling to get young people to connect with the church. The Lord showed us that this is the year of the young people. And I'm looking for God to do something in this service that is going to stop the momentum of all of the violence that has been happening in the Warren area in several years. I really need us to try to get in the spirit concerning this service on Sunday. God is going to stop murders out of this service. He's going to prevent young people from going into incarceration. God's going to do something for our young ladies and our young men that are looking for love and that are looking for answers that can only be found in Jesus Christ. So I've been praying this year of the young people, not just here in Calvary, but that it will overflow in the Second Baptist Church. How many believe with me that God can do that? So I, I'm excited about this service, and the Lord uh, put this in the First Lady spirit and in her mind for us to have this service. So she said, well, who do you think we should have come? And the Lord brought before me Pastor Todd Johnson. I have a lot of respect for him. He's a young man with tremendous vision and integrity. I feel very good about what God is doing in our community with the young pastors, including Nathan Brantley, that he's raising up in this community. And he's no steps behind. No steps behind. Kevin Carson, no steps behind. Todd Johnson, God's hand is on him. Some might consider him to be a late bloomer. I see him right on time. And I see the glory that is coming upon him greater than any in his family. Now, you know how much I love and appreciate and admire Bishop C. Wayne Brantley, but one greater than C. Wayne is here. I see the hand of God on him. And I come on now. I see God's hand on him. 
in the name of Jesus. Now, we've got to keep him covered in prayer. Him and his wife, Rachel. I told Nathan, Rachel is the best thing that happened to you since the Holy Ghost. God's hand is on her. Prayer co covered him in prayer. A hedge, a, a protection for him. Very kind, very wise, very discerning. So I really want you to kind of uh, keep them uh, near the top of your prayer list because I see something. And, and the first lady said to me, she said, John, who do you who do you see ministering in that service? I said, let me pray about it. And the Lord brought to me Todd Johnson. Todd Johnson comes from a cogent background. He is not unfamiliar with the Holy Ghost. The scripture said the traditions of men make the word of God of none effect. So he comes into a situation, a great church, a great believing and worshiping church, uh, but one like many who are very committed to the traditions of their past. So to introduce the baptism of the Holy Ghost into the Second Baptist Church is a big thing. But God has given him wisdom. And now they're coming into a position of receptivity. So if we come in here in the right mindset, spiritually and emotionally on Sunday, I'm looking for the Holy Ghost to fall. I'm looking for no, I'm not looking for an altar worker. I'm not looking for an altar call. I'm looking for them to come into the presence of the Lord that is going to be created through prayer beginning at 6 a.m. on Sunday morning. The Lord sh showed me specifically that 6 a.m. prayer was to be brought back for this one specific Sunday on Pentecost Sunday. We're going to get the atmosphere right. Now, when we come in for that service on Sunday afternoon, I do not want you to go pile up under the balcony. I want every Calvary member to make sure that you're somewhere near the front of this sanctuary because we must have control of the atmosphere of the altar. So when you have worshipers and intercessors that are praying and worshiping all in this front section of the church, it creates uh, access where people can enter into the presence of God. They don't feel shameful. They don't feel intimidated to approach God at this altar. We're going to get the altar ready in 6 a.m. prayer on Sunday morning. Not only is the Holy Ghost going to fall, but there are going to be many that experience healings in their body. I want you to get that in your prayer on this week as we're praying and fasting Believing God for miraculous healings, deliverance from, as I see it in the spirit, deliverance from mental conditions, depression, spirits of oppression, things that are weighing people down. God wants to lift their burdens and give them a clear sight that God is in the midst of them. This is not just another service. It is going to initiate a move of God that is going to continue throughout the summer. I want control of the atmosphere on the altar. We want to come in with worship. We want to come in with praise. Don't eat so much dinner after morning service that you're too sleepy to give God praise at 4 o'clock. Let the whole day be conditioned to give God glory, give God praise, and give God honor because I'm looking for God to do wonders in the midst of us. If you believe God's going to do it, why don't you give him a praise that God can receive right now? you got to get your voice involved. Hallelujah. Let us say Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands and say praise the Lord. So I'm just excited about what God is doing. Now I want to take that power from that service to Akron with me on Sunday night. Now you know we were in Akron last year for Pentecost Sunday. And I'm going to go back. After I leave this service, their, their, their citywide Pentecost service begins at 6 p.m., on Sunday, so I'm going to stay here as long as I can. Then I'm going to take the power from this altar 
and I'm going to carry it with me over to Akron, Ohio. I'm looking for God to do the same thing over there that he's going to be doing over here. Aren't you glad to be back in the sanctuary? I am. Give the Lord a good praise for that. I want to say something to you about the sanctuary. I was praying this morning. I said, Lord, I sure would love to uh, stay in your sanctuary. He said, I'll let you stay there if you keep praising me. But if you go back to sitting down on me, I'll kick you right back out. I don't want God to have to kick us back down to the gym. Have no problem with the gym. Thank God for it. Thank God that we have a church that has enough space for us to go to another area if we're not in this space. But I want to stay in here where the prayers are, where the glory of God is. I want to stay here. And the Lord said, I'll let you stay if you keep praising me. I need about five saints that have true worship in their spirit to make sure every Sunday morning that that area underneath the balcony is saturated with praise and worship. I know I got some worshipers back there, but I need some with more vocality to let those that see if you're coming to visit a church, it's your natural inclination to gravitate to the back of the auditorium. You don't know anybody. You don't necessarily feel comfortable. When I go to a church for the first time, I don't run to the front row. I normally try to get somewhere near the back of the auditorium because I just want to blend in. But Mount Calvary is not a blend-in situation. It's a place where you come to get healed. This is a church where you come to get delivered. This is a place where you come to get filled with the Holy Ghost. This is a place where God brings you to restore your family. This is a place where God comes to heal your mind and we can't have that underneath the balcony section as a spectator zone that can't be a dead zone it was too flat back there on Sunday morning we had all of those visitors all of those young people who haven't received the Holy Ghost all those young people that need deliverance in areas of their life I need me about five or ten worshipers that'll tell God every time I come in here when I get back there I'm gonna release such a power in my worship it'll flow from the back of the church to the front of the church somebody help me get a praise in the house you can probably feel my energy you probably can feel you probably feel my urgency because God's going to do something here on Sunday of a supernatural nature. And it can't happen without worship and praise. Can we lift our hands and say hallelujah? So whoever you are, I need you to, I need you to get control of that section back there. We're not going to have an under anywhere space in the new sanctuary. No spaces where people feel separated from the service. I've sat back there, and just because of the way that the sanctuary is constructed, it can make you feel that you're separated from the mainstream of the worship. Well, we're going to take care of that in the new sanctuary. We'll make sure that everyone is equal distances from the altar and the pulpit area. But until we get there... Let's praise him like we're already there. Do you feel me? All right. Let's do it. Let me talk to you a few minutes this afternoon from the subject Pentecost in perspective. We're familiar with that. Pentecost in perspective. Minister, if you take a look at these, everything is a blur to me. That's good when you're looking at men, mean faces, but I'm among friendly faces. So I want to see the friendly faces. I want to invite your attention to Leviticus chapter 23. And we're going to begin reading at Verse number one, Leviticus 23, beginning at verse number one. Those of you that are viewing online, I'd like to ask you to help me get this message into more ears and into more hearts. 
You can do that by hitting the share button, hitting the like button, commenting, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and just help me get the word out here that God has for us today. Pentecost in perspective. I want to use as a subtopic today, seeing Jesus in the seven feasts of the Lord. Seeing Jesus in the seven feasts of the Lord. I have a lot to try to cover here in about 40 minutes. So I'm going to be moving at a little quicker pace than normal today. But follow along with me beginning at Leviticus chapter 23. Reading aloud here and wherever you are at verse 1 from the King James Bible. Let's read saints. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are, whose feasts are they? They're God's feasts. Verse number three. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Verse 4, these are the feasts. They're the Lord's feasts, even holy convocations. Let's move over to the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 2. Picking up the text at verse 19. Ephesians chapter 2, and we're reading, beginning at verse number 19. Thank you, son. If you have it, can you say amen? amen. All right, Ephesians 2 and 19. Let's read. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. And of the household, this is why it is important for us to be bridge builders, connecting the body of Christ beyond denominational lines. Verse number 20, let's read. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Come on, Jesus Christ himself being the chief. All things come together in Christ. All roads point to Jesus. Verse number 21, let's read. In whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple. No matter how pretty the carpet is, no matter how attractive the windows may be, or how stylish the furniture may be, the structural viability of any building begins with the strength of its foundation. The foundation of the New Testament and the foundation of the church is the Old Testament. If all of your emphasis is only on the Old Testament with no inclusion of the revelation of the New Testament, your perspective of God and the scriptures is in balance. The same is also true of the New Testament. If you are of the mind said, I, I don't need the Old Testament. I have all of the revelation, all of the insight, all of the understanding that I need in the New Testament. You are going to be out of balance in terms of the proper interpretation and application of the scriptures. The Old Testament, with all of its various types, its shadows, its principles, its precepts, is not an end in and of itself. The Old Testament is not an end in and of itself. The Old Testament provides us with the means to an end. That end is Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega. 
Jesus Christ, the beginning and the end. Jesus Christ, the first and the last. Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus Christ, the amen. Hebrews chapter 10 in our Bibles, verse number 1. Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to read verses 1 and 9 from Hebrews 10. Read with me, please, class. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto the law revealed sin, but the law could not cleanse us from sin. The law revealed the perfect order of God, but the law could not make us perfect. Read verse number nine, if you will, please. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that is, the first system of sacrifice, the first sacrificial system. He taketh away the first, read, that he may establish in the Jewish holidays, also known as the seven feasts of the Lord, God's eternal plan for mankind from creation to salvation is prophetically fulfilled through the nature and the timing of the seven annual feasts of the Lord. Friends who are coming to make a commitment to be followers of Christ, I want to submit to you that the concept of sacrifice is the major feature of these seven feasts. The principle the practice of sacrifice. It runs through the Old Testament and the New Testament like a scarlet thread. With Jesus Christ being the ultimate sacrifice, teaching us that if one is going to be a follow, follower of Christ, he or she must be committed to a life of sacrifice. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. A follower of Christ must be committed to a life of sacrifice. It's not just a matter of what can God do for me, but also involved is what can I do for God? What can I do for the, for the people of God? What can I do for the church? What can I do for my community? It is a life of sacrifice. Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. Do you have it? All right, if we have it, let's read it together aloud, please. What does the Bible say? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies, here it is, a living, no more turtle doves, no more goats, no more lambs. Present your body a living sacrifice. What else? Holy, yes. Acceptable unto God. It is not, it's not a difficult thing to do. How does the Bible describe it? Which is your what? And I hear people talk about how hard it is. To live say. It's not hard to live say. It's hard to go to hell. You got to step all over mercy. You got to fight your way past grace. You got to try to get around the goodness of God. That is surrounding you on every side every day. It's not hard to be saved. My yoke is easy. Come on, saints. My burdens, they are light. 
Once you get a made up mind that I'm going to live my life God's way, God will give you help to make this journey. Am I right about that? I don't want you to get out of balance and get trapped in the shadows of the Old Testament. The New Testament born again believer, preach son, is not required to keep the seven feasts of the Lord in the literal mechanisms of the Old Testament. I want to make sure you get that. The New Testament believer is not required to keep the seven feasts of the Lord in the literal mechanisms of the Old Testament. But the knowledge of them and their spiritual correlation to the New Testament believer, it expands our knowledge of Jesus Christ and our application of the spiritual synergy between the Old Testament and the New. We do not have to go back to the literal mechanisms of the sacrificial system or the types or the shadows of the Old Testament. We are living in the fulfillment of them in Jesus Christ. So we're dealing as it pertains to the seven feasts of the Lord. We're dealing with the Jewish calendar versus the Gregorian calendar. God's calendar is always determined by the phases of the moon. Each month in a lunar calendar begins with a new moon. So then, Passover, it falls on the first full moon of the spring. The first three feasts. Let me hear the class say Passover. Unleavened bread, first fruits. These first three feasts of the spring, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, they fall in the months of March and April. The fourth feast, which we will celebrate on Sunday, Pentecost, it marks the late spring harvest and it occurs usually in late May or early June. For our viewers who perhaps are unfamiliar with the seven feasts of the Lord, let me share them with you. Number one, Passover. Number two, unleavened bread. Number three, first fruits. Number four, Pentecost. Those first four are already fulfilled. These last three have not yet been fulfilled in totality. Number five, the Feast of Trumpets. Number six, Yom Kippur or the Feast of Atonement. And then number seven, Tabernacle. Let's make sure that we all have that. Say it with me. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, tabernacles. Let's look briefly at the feast of Passover. Here's the principle of it. In both testaments, the old and the new, the blood of the lamb, it delivers from bondage. In the Old Testament, you see the story in the book of Exodus, the blood of the lamb was smeared on the doorpost of each Jewish home, disallowing the death angel to enter in and kill the firstborn of God's people. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. 
And through his blood, we have forgiveness and remission of sins and access to new life in Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 18. Let's read together what Peter has to say about Christ fulfilling the feast of Passover. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18. Let's read it together. For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. Come on, read it with a little more energy, please. As silver and gold from your vain conversation received by traditions from your father. Here it is. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb. Blood delivered from death in the Old Testament. Blood delivers from death in the New Testament. Let the church say, thank God for the blood. Let's look at the second feast, unleavened bread. You can read more about this in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 6 in your free time. But leaven or yeast in the bread symbolize sin and unrighteousness. Unleavened bread eaten over a period of time, it typifies the holy walk of a child of God. It typifies sanctification. It typifies separation from sin. Unleavened bread. It represented the body of the Lord Jesus. Jesus is described as the bread of life. He was born in Bethlehem, which means house of bread. The matzah cracker is striped, symbolizing that by his stripes we are healed. It has little holes in it. The scripture said they shall look upon him whom they pierce. There was a Passover custom of hiding and then resurrecting the second and third pieces of the matzah. The middle piece represented Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And it also prophetically symbolized Jesus being the centerpiece of the crucifixion scene, where he was surrounded on the left and on the right by two thieves. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and let's pick up the text at verse number 6. So you can see how Christ is the fulfillment of all of the feasts. Seeing Jesus in the seven feasts of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let us begin reading at verse number 6. Now, before I read, I want to welcome all of you that have joined us in the class this afternoon. And I want to remind you that on this coming Sunday right here at Mount Calvary at 4 p.m., we're going to be celebrating our Pentecost Sunday services. The dynamic pastor Todd Johnson and the Second Baptist Church of Warren, Ohio, are going to be our guests, and we're looking for Jesus to show up in the midst of the worship and the praise. We want you to come on over and be with us. We'll be here on Sunday morning. I'm going to preach a little bit on Sunday morning. Then Pastor Todd's going to come and take us home at 4 o'clock. Sunday afternoon, we're wearing white, but if you don't have white, don't worry about that. Just come with clean hands and a clean heart, and God will meet you in the service. I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 6. Let's read, family. Your glory is not good. Come on. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Verse number 7. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven that ye may be a new lump. Every saint of God, no matter how long they've been saved and walking with the Lord, still has a little leaven that we're praying for God to get out of our lives. Oh, amen, somebody. Still a little something in our temperament. Still a little leaven in our disposition. A little leaven in how we talk to our husband or our wife how we entreat our children. 
We're working on that every day, asking God to cleanse us, wash us, and forgive us on a daily basis for sins known and unknown. Because what might appear to be acceptable righteousness in our sight is like filthy rags in the sight of a perfectly holy God. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Why is pastor called so many fasts? Because we're purging out, therefore, the old leaven, that you might be a new lump, I'm in verse 7, as ye are unleavened. Read that last clause of verse 7 with me. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrifice. Verse number 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not in the Old Testament literal mechanism of the feast. He tells us how to keep the feast. Not with old leaven, read, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Here it is in the New Testament. How do we keep the feast of the Lord in the New Testament? Read that last clause. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity... So you do, you see how that translates into spiritual in the New Testament. Let's look at the third feast of the Lord, the feast of first fruits. Now in the Old Testament, first fruits was the festival or the celebration in which the people of God acknowledged the goodness of God in the fertility of the land that God had given them. The spies that Moses sent into Canaan described the land as one flowing with milk and with honey. They were to bring their early crops from the spring planting and wave the sheaf offering before the Lord. You say, well, how is Jesus fulfill the offering of first fruits when Christ was lifted up from the earth on the cross and the earth began to shake when the natural elements recognized that the king of glory was being crucified by the hands of wicked men Christ becomes our wave offering before the Lord and he further fulfills the feast of first fruits by being the first of those who are resurrected from the dead. This is a celebration. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 20. Monday through Friday, we are in consecration for Pentecost Sunday. But Sunday is going to be a party all day. I'm going to help you see that as I move a little further here in the lesson. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's read together verse number 20. Let's read. But now is Christ risen. Aren't you glad about that? What else? And become the first fruits. You ought to look over and tell somebody near you. Can't no grave hold my body down. Thank you, Jesus. Verse number 21, read. For since by man came death, by man came also the... And that man was Jesus Christ. Verse 22, but as in Adam all die. Come on, saints. Even so in Christ shall all be made up. Verse 23, but every man in his own order, here it is, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ, that's you and me. We are going to be a part of that great resurrection. When the trump of God sounds and the dead in Christ shall rise first, the fulfillment of the feast of the first fruits. Then we come to our primary focus for this week and weekend, the Feast of Pentecost. 
Read with me Leviticus chapter 23, beginning at verse 16. Leviticus 23, verse 16. Let's read, family. Even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Verse 17, everyone. Ye shall bring out of your habitation two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They shall be of fine flour. Now here's one of the differences between the early offering. The first presentation had no leaven. Read this last clause. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits. The two loaves represent the church being comprised of both Jew and Gentile. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized. Let me hear this class say baptized. For by one spirit we are all baptized into how many bodies? One body. Read on. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be born or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit. I want to go a little further with that in Ephesians chapter 2. Let's pick up the text at verse number 11. This great Pentecostal experience that we're going to see manifest in our midst on Sunday. Ephesians chapter 2 Verse number 11, read with me. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hand. I want you to read verse 12 with you in mind. I want you to read this with the intentional reflection on where God brought you from. Read verse 12. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God. That sounds like us. But God had another plan. What the devil thought he was going to do for our destruction. God had a superior plan through the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, there ought to be no occasion where any redeemed person can't think of anything to give God praise for. Just the remembrance of where he brought me from is enough for me to praise him from sun up to sundown. I'd come to tell you he brought us from a mighty long way. Is there anybody else in the room that can say it was God that brought you all the way? Hey, I feel the Holy Ghost. Look over and tell somebody he brought me and he's still bringing me. Because he's not through blessing you yet. If he brought you this far, he can take you the rest of the way. Glory to heaven. Look at this now. Look at where we are now. Because of Christ and his blood. Verse 13, let's read with gratitude. But now, where are we? Ye who sometime were far off. Read are made nigh by the hallelujah verse 14 for he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall apart oh that's what i'm looking to happen on sunday hallelujah i'm looking for god to break down this stronghold wall that has separated the Baptists from the Pentecostals. Know your history now. Mount Calvary used to be a Baptist church. 
But Evangelist E.M. Hudson from New Jersey in 1930 came to Mount Calvary preaching for the first time. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, the baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues. And because God sent that praying woman to Youngstown, Ohio, here we are in 2024, filled with the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, covered by the blood, redeemed by the Lamb, and on our way to heaven and enjoying the trip. Y'all don't sound like you want to go to heaven. Lift your hand and say, Lord, break down that wall. You believe he can do it? I didn't say that right. Do you believe he will do it? Can we say amen? I told you the story about when I got to Canton to become pastor there and 1993, they had never had fellowship, never had ecumenical fellowship. <laughs> the Lord had in, instructed me to invite one of the Baptist churches to come and worship with us, and I invited their pastor to preach. That was a big deal in that church because before my coming there, if a guest minister came that wasn't apostolic, they were not even allowed into the pulpit. And I said, you all must, you call yourself Bible scholars, but the scripture said those that are filled with the Holy Spirit are very hospitable. That's in the book. Sometimes you can win a person with kindness before you can win them with a sermon. I said, we're going to have this preacher come, and we're not going to banish him to the back. I'm going to have him preach. He's going to sit in the pulpit next to me. I had to have a saints meeting. I started a civil war. People were talking about leaving the church over this. I said, I'm going to call a special saints meeting. I'm going to explain what the spirit has shown me, and God's going to back it up. So the saints came in that night more so to watch than to worship. And while the choir from the Baptist church was singing, the sister that was playing the piano fell off the piano bent speaking in tongues. No altar call. No altar worker. The sermon had not even been preached yet. It was just God being God. Because when the Holy Ghost fell on the day of Pentecost, there were no altar workers in the room. God can do it all by himself. I wish I could get some believers in here. That's how I'm looking for it to fall on Sunday. Somebody say, do it, Lord. And I'm going to tell you this. Some of the folk from the Baptist church aren't the only ones that need to fall out. Some of us right here in the Mount Calvary Pentecostal church every Sunday morning that have dried up like a piece of cardboard need the Holy Ghost to fall on us one more time. If you don't mind the Holy Ghost falling on you again, just lift your hand and shout me, Lord. Spirit-filled saint ought to pray and ask the Lord, Lord, don't let me go too long without speaking in tongues. I thought I'd get an amen. I thought somebody would say amen. You ought to pray and say, Lord, don't let me go too long. Hey, shine up a whole sick Don't let me go too long without feeling what I felt the day you delivered my soul from sin. Don't oh, let me go too long without feeling the joy of the Lord that gives me strength when 
my soul is tired. Don't let me go too long without letting me know that you're walking right beside me. That you hear my cries. That you see my tears. The late Elder Albert Turner was the assistant pastor of Christ Church. He said, son, I want you to pray that the Lord will bless you to speak in tongues every day. And I took that prayer to heart. And I asked God, Lord, I just, I just want to know you're with me. I just want to feel you there. And the Lord put that, put that Holy Ghost soul in my soul. Sometimes people think I'm crazy. Because I just started speaking in tongue to the cash register at the Giant Eagle. She said, what did you say? I said, oh, I'm glad you're having a nice day. Thank you, Jesus. I'd rather speak in tongues and somebody not understand what I'm saying and God know what the sentiment of my heart is. I'd rather God hear me than for man to hear me. Watch this now. Lord, my time. Verse number 15. Read with me. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, read, even the law of commandment I Moshe, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, verses 16, 17, and 18, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh the Jews and the Gentiles. Verse 18, for through him we both, Jews and Gentiles, have access by one spirit. Can we say praise the Lord? Now observe as we get ready to close how Jesus fulfills all of the seven feasts. Four are already fulfilled. Three are yet to be fulfilled, but they will. The next being the Feast of Trumpets, representing the rapture of the church. Jesus fulfilled the Passover feast when he was crucified on the Passover. He fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread when he was buried in the grave. He fulfilled the feast of first fruits when he was resurrected from the dead. And he fulfilled the feast of Pentecost when he sent back the Holy Ghost. Can y'all give me about 10 more minutes? All right. I want to talk just a few minutes before I leave the air about the necessity of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There is a misconception going on in the religious community today concerning the necessity to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be saved. Some mistakenly believe that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the baptism Baptism of the Holy Spirit are two separate experiences. They believe that it is possible to receive the Holy Spirit without being baptized in the Holy Ghost. But the scriptures teach us that the receiving of the Spirit of God is the same as being filled with the Holy Ghost. Being filled with the Holy Ghost is the same as being baptized in the Spirit. They are not two separate experiences. I want to show you that in the scripture. Go to Joel chapter 2 and let's pick it up at verse number 28. 
I'm going to deal with tongues for just a minute before I close. Joel chapter 2, let's begin reading verses 28 and 29. Let's read it, please. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit. I want everyone that is watching this class online to type in that comment section, the Holy Ghost is for me. I want you to put that in the comment section. The Holy Ghost is for me. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Read on. And your sons and your daughters shall do what? Come on, saints. Your old men shall do what? What are the young men going to do? See visions. Verse 29 read. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Now this promise was fulfilled in Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 4 when the disciples were filled with the Holy Ghost and the initial evidence that they were filled according to the scriptures is that they began to speak with other tongues as the spirit of God gave them the utterance. Let me stop here for a second and let all of my viewers know no one can give you the Holy Ghost but God. Say amen to that. Nobody but God. And this is where Minister Armour, who God used her on Thursday night in a mighty way, this is where a lot of people get hung up. They can't see the logic of why speaking in tongues is so important. Their, 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 their logical mind says, what is, the, what is the relevance between speaking with tongues and salvation? Well, I'm going to tell you why tongues are so important. Because a tongue uncontrolled by the Spirit of God will reverse every blessing the favor of God brings into your life and because some of you refuse to allow the Holy Ghost to control your tongue you keep talking yourself out of health in the sickness you are talking yourself out of prosperity in the poverty you can talk yourself out of gladness into madness. You can talk yourself out of strength into weakness. How is that possible? Proverbs 18 and 22. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit of it. Why are tongues important? Am I not saved by grace? Yes, you are. Am I not redeemed by the blood? Yes, you are. But you need the empowerment of the Spirit indwelling you to become a son of God. Look what the scripture said in James chapter 3 and verse number 2. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the saying is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. I'm in James chapter 3 and verse 3. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasted great things. Behold, how great a matter, a little fire kindleth. And the tongue, verse 6, is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed by mankind. But, verse 8, the tongue can no man tame, 
it is unruly evil full of deadly poison it takes the power of the Holy Ghost to tame the tongue oh yes it does takes the power of the Holy Ghost to keep me from talking myself in the hell Acts chapter 2 let's go at verse number 14 five more minutes Acts 2 verse 14 read with me out loud but Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem be this known unto you and hearken to my words 15 for these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now he's prophesying about the season and the time that we are living in right now. The dispensation of grace, the era of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 17. And it shall come in the last days, that's where we are now, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see vision, and your old men shall dream dreams. Verse 18, and on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days my spirit and they shall Prophesy. Drop down to verse number 39. Who is this Holy Ghost for? Verse number 39. What does the Bible say? For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. The promise is for the Jews. It's for the Samaritans. It's for the Gentiles. It's for everyone. The same Holy Ghost with the same manner of impartation was given to the Samaritans. On the day of Pentecost, the scripture said they were filled with the Holy Ghost. It said in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 4 and Acts chapter 8 and verse number 17 that they received the Holy Ghost. In relationship to the Gentiles, the scripture said that it fell on them. And they began to speak with tongues as it fell on them, as it did on us at the beginning. Acts chapter 11 and verse number 16. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Verse 17, I want you to read that out loud with me. For as much then as God gave them the light gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus, what was I that I could? And I want to say that to those of you who are fighting the Holy Ghost. Who are you that you can withstand God? Acts chapter 15 and verse number 8. But that and my grandma and them didn't speak in tongues. Who are you that you can withstand God? I didn't grow up like that. That wasn't a part of my religious orientation. Who art thou? That thou might withstand God. God is trying to take you to a whole nother dimension in your spiritual walk with God. Acts chapter 15 and verse number 8. Read. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, because can't nobody give it to you but God, even as he did unto us, verse 9, and put no difference between us and them. All these descriptions that we just read of people being baptized with the Holy Ghost uses different terminology, but the same experience. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. They received the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost fell upon them, and all three of those descriptions, there are four that I read, all of them mean the same thing, that they spake with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. Well, Pastor Tyson, is it an absolute necessity that I have the baptism of the Holy Ghost to be saved? Yes, it is. 
In order to be the sons of God, we must be filled with the Spirit of God. It is not an option. It is a prerequisite for access to the kingdom of God and the body of Christ. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is a prerequisite for access to the kingdom of God, the body of Christ, and the resurrection of the dead. That's something that I definitely want. Because I want to be with my family and my friends again. I want to see my mother and my father again. I want to see my brother again. And it is the baptism of the Holy Ghost that makes me a candidate for the resurrection. Because it's the Holy Ghost. It's the power that's going to transform you from mortal to immortal. Can we say amen? John chapter 3 and verse number 3. The Holy Ghost is pushing me on this. Holy Ghost is pushing me in this. John chapter 3 and verse number 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, No, I'm not talking about a natural condition. This is a spiritual birth. Verse 5, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He can join the church, but he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He can be on the usher board, but he can't enter the kingdom of God. He can preach and sing, but he can't enter the kingdom of God. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is what? Flesh. Read the next part. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. What does verse 7 say? Marvel not that I say unto thee, is it an option? You must be. Let me close on this. You can't be saved without the spirit of God inside of you. That's the scripture. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 8. So I, don't, I just want to put that out there and you take my word for it. I want you to take, the, take what God said about this matter. I need the Holy Ghost to be saved, Reverend Tice. I need the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues according to the Bible you do. And I think I'm going to take God at his word. I'm going to take God at his word every time. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 8. What does the Bible say? But ye are not in the flesh... But in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell where? Read on. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ. Let me share something with you that you can kind of think about as you're preparing for Pentecost Sunday and meditating and praying and studying the rest of this week because I'm looking for an outpouring. And I'm looking for a renewal of the spirit, the soul, the mind, and the body. I just want to leave you with this today. 14 things less commonly known about Pentecost. 14 things, or we'll say 14 less commonly known facts about Pentecost. Let's say it that way. 14 less commonly known facts about Pentecost. I don't have time to exegete. I'll just give them to you. Look it up. Number one, Pentecost marks the end of the barley harvest and is the beginning of the wheat harvest. Number two, many of the feasts of the Lord had several days, but Pentecost is the only feast with one day. Number three, the emphasis at the Feast of Pentecost was not fasting. The emphasis of Pentecost was feasting. They ate and drank on the day of Pentecost. Number four, Pentecost, we often talk about the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost, but there were three births as a result of the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is a celebration of the birth of, the, of Israel as a nation. 
they existed as a people prior to the first Feast of Pentecost. But it was the day of Pentecost or the Feast of Pentecost in which God formed them as a nation. It is secondly, the birth of the church. And it is thirdly, the birth of spiritual moments and spiritual movements. That's what Sunday afternoon is going to be. It's going to be the birth of a spiritual movement in this area. Number five, Pentecost commemorates the day that God gave the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Number six, Pentecost was the first time since Adam's sin that a man was permitted to stand in the glory of God. Moses up on Mount Sinai for 40 days. It also proves that the glory of God can sustain a man's physical body. He was 40 days without food or water, but came down from the mountain, emanating the glory of God upon his countenance. Number seven, Pentecost was a celebration of what God gave to them. They brought to God what was in their house. It was different than the initial wave offering, the wheat offering, the barley offering. It was a celebration of how they took what God had gave them and developed something from it that was a blessing to others. Number eight, on Pentecost, read this when you get home, Psalm 69 was recited on the day of Pentecost. I want to make that uh, the scripture reading for Sunday morning. Psalm 69. Psalm 69 is comprised of 49 Hebrew words symbolizing the counting of the Omar, which signify that praise produces increase. Number nine. Every feast was a rehearsal. All seven feasts are just preparation for the grand finale, which is the millennial kingdom. Number 10, 500 persons received the directive from Jesus to go back to Jerusalem and wait for the power to come upon them. Well, how do you know it was 500, Pastor Tyson? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 6. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. But, only 120 showed up in the upper room fulfilling the parable that Jesus taught in Mark chapter 4 where he taught about the four different types of ground representing the condition of the heart to either reject or receive the word of God. So then it was one-fourth of the 500 that Jesus said, go back to Jerusalem and wait until you be endued with power from on high. I don't need to be in the majority if I'm in the minority with Jesus. Look at this. Number 11. One of the praises that was offered on the day of Pentecost when translated from Hebrew into English says, they tried to kill us, but we won. Let's eat. That's why they didn't fast on the day. Hosea. That's why they didn't fast on the day of Pentecost because they were celebrating how God kept them alive when he drowned Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. I just want to put that in the atmosphere. Somebody help me say they tried to kill us, but we won. Let's praise him. I think we need to pause right there and give him a praise. Praise your name. That devil come to steal, kill, and destroy. But God has given us life. And that more abundantly. They tried to kill us, but we won. Let's see. Number 12. Pentecost is the only Jewish holiday without a specific date attached to it. It's 50 days after Pentecost. So then, Pentecost is not an addendum to Passover. Pentecost is the reason for Passover. 
how God brought us out of spiritual bondage, how he brought us into the liberty and the grace of righteousness. I'd like for you to read the book of Ruth the rest of this week leading up to Pentecost Sunday. During their preparation for Pentecost, it was their custom to read the book of Ruth during the last seven days before Pentecost because in Ruth is the story of the kinsman redeemer. And I'm going to leave you with this, number 14. 14 things not commonly known about Pentecost Sunday. It is believed by the rabbis that King David was born on the day of Pentecost, which was a prophetic indicator that the power of the Holy, that the baptism of the Holy Ghost does not only come with power, but it comes with the key of David. It comes with praise. That's why back in the old church, if a person allegedly received the Holy Ghost, but they came from the altar or the prayer room without joy, they would send them back because David was born on the day of Pentecost indicating that the baptism of the Holy Ghost comes with joy. So when God fills you with the Holy Ghost, the joy bells start ringing in your soul. It opens the windows in heaven and that key of David opens doors on earth. That's why I'm always telling you, uh, give God more praise and give God more glory and give God more honor because every praise opens another door of opportunity, of favor, of grace, of strength, and of healing. Just open some doors for about 30 seconds. Just open some doors. Somebody needs a blessing. Somebody needs a healing in their body. Somebody needs a family member saved. Somebody needs a burden lifted. I'm going to give you a secret. You got to do it with all your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. Shout glory here. So we're going to give him praise. We're going to fast and pray. Hey, glory. We're going to consecrate the rest of the week. But Sunday, it's going to be a praise service in here like we have not had this year. So get your shouting shoes and bring those Sunday. Don't wear your heels too. Hey, thank you. Don't wear your heels too high on Sunday so you can give God praise. Glory, worship, adoration, and honor. You that are watching me this afternoon, you said, Pastor Tyson, I want the Holy Ghost. I want to be baptized in the power. I want to know that God is living inside of me. I want more than religion, more than tradition. I want more than church. I want Christ in me, the hope of glory. There's a number on the screen that you may call we can't give you the Holy Ghost, but we can pray to the Lord who gives it. We will pray with you. We will wait with you. We will show you the scriptures that deal with God's power and promise to your life. Call 330-747-4445. And God himself will give you this wonderful gift. It will change your life, won't it, saints? Change your whole life. And it will elevate your spiritual perceptivity and relationship with God in a manner that just the book cannot do. The letter kills, but it is the spirit that maketh alive. So you call us here at the church. We'll be happy to baptize you in water in the name of Jesus. And God is ready to fill you with the Holy Ghost. Before we leave the air today, I want to remind all of the Calvary family everywhere to join us in our midweek offering today. We certainly try to worship the Lord as officers are coming to help us. We try every Tuesday our best to give the Lord a $20 free will offering in the Tuesday offering. And if you weren't here on Sunday, for whatever the reasons may have been, might have just slipped your mind with all of this electronic giving. Be mindful of the Lord's tithe on today. What is a tithe? This is the first 10% 
our increase in our income that is sown into the work of the Lord for advancing kingdom building offices may come to serve. If you're in need of a contribution envelope, just lift your hands at this time and the minister of order will be glad to serve you. Just lift your hand. If you're in need of a contribution envelope, your giving helps us to improve the quality of our media ministry to you. We want to bring you ministry of the highest quality, beautiful pictures, quality sound. We don't want you having to fight to hear and see the service. We're going to be making some upgrades to our equipment here in the church. We need to do about $25,000 worth of upgrades to our equipment here because we're broadcasting the gospel to all of the world. So those of you who watch this webcast and say, Pastor Tyson, I'd like to make a contribution to your media ministry. There's somebody watching that could be able to sow the whole $25,000 and not miss it a day. I want to invite you to come and share with us in expanding the kingdom. We're now coming to you every Sunday morning on radio. We're back on radio for the first time in 20 years. And someone was so impacted by the ministries that come from our church. The church is not paying for airtime. They're paying for it. They said we. No, I. It's one person. I am going to donate that one hour. Every Sunday morning from 10 to 11. To get the gospel from Mount Calvary. Back on the radio airwaves. Hundreds of thousands of people heard the gospel from this church every Sunday night. 8 o'clock WBBW, received the Holy Ghost, was saved, healed, and delivered. So I'm glad to be back on radio along with this medium of internet. The Lord bless you today. Officers may go forth to serve the saints. I pray that you're giving online. Now, we're going to have to, we're going to be closing the office and the building today. Immediately following the benediction, we, the Lord is blessing us. As we're further making upgrades here in the church, and the, the gentleman is here, he was so gracious, he came to install a new hot water tank for us. And I'm very grateful for that. And I asked him would he wait until Bible study was over. And he's shut, shutting down the water in the building. So after the benediction, I'm going to ask you to let us be dismissed, not only from the Bible class, but from the building so that they may proceed with the work that they are doing. All right. The Lord bless you, saints. Heaven smile upon you. I pray that you have a blessed rest of the afternoon. Let's stay before God in this fast. We're fasting 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. We are drinking water throughout the day. We don't want anyone to become dehydrated or sick. We're drinking water throughout the day. The prayer directives are at calvaryforyou.org and let's let's stay committed to this five day fast as we're looking for God on Sunday. Let us all stand. Please. Father, we thank you for this gift, this great gift of the spirit of God dwelling in these earthen vessels. Now I pray that we will always appropriate the value to this great gift that you have given us. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us as we depart from the house of the Lord, that the angels will remain encamped around about us, keeping us from danger seen and unseen. Let us move with open eyes and open ears that we may see the people and the opportunities that God presents unto us throughout the rest of the week to be a blessing to someone else. Now, Lord, let the momentum of the Spirit of God continue to build leading up to Sunday. Clear the atmosphere over the city so that the Holy Spirit may have clear access to Youngstown. I rebuke every unclean spirit that would come to try to attack the spirit, the mind of the body of Pastor Todd Johnson. We seal him in the secret place of the Most High God 
And we ask that the voice of God would enter into his private meditations and prayer. That you would give unto him the word from heaven that's going to shift Mahoning and Trumbull County. We thank you, Lord, in advance for what you're going to do. Expectations create results. And we're expecting a move of God in the name of Jesus. Now cover us in your blood and keep us under your loving care. In the name of Jesus, thank God. Every heart say amen. The Lord bless you, say.